And uh, then we'll hear from uh, the CFA colloquium speaker today, uh, Sarah Gibson. I'm not sure if she joined us already or, oh, here she is, uh, from UCAR, and she will tell us about the magnetism and the invisible man, uh, the mysteries of coronal cavities. Uh, we are all anticipating, waiting to hear another this metaphor was used. Uh, and finally, we'll hear from Nanda Rhee uh, from Amsterdam, and she will tell us about the pulsar spin period distribution as the first evidence for an amorphous state of matter. Go ahead, Andrew. Great. So thank you for that introduction. Uh, today, I'm talking about a unifying theory for scaling laws of human population. And you might think that's kind of a funny title to be giving um, a talk about here. So, but actually, I want to do two things in this talk. So first, I want to explain what the project is behind this title, of course. But second of all, I want to convince you that actually thinking about human population and scaling laws of this nature is not something inappropriate to be doing here at the CFA. That there really is something that astrophysicists can contribute to thinking about a field, a field like this. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to introduce you or remind you of two laws that we know about um, in terms of human population. And the first of these laws is a very famous law. It's called Zipf's Law. And it's very simple. It just says that for a given country, the population of a city is inversely proportional to its rank. So, for example, in the United States, the most populous city is New York, and it has some population. Los Angeles, which is the second most populous city, has roughly half the population of New York. Chicago, which is the third most populous city, has roughly a third of the population of New York and so forth. And if we want to be a little bit more statistical, we can make a plot, of course, of all these cities. And you can see the prediction, which is the, uh, the, the solid black line on this curve. It fits the data fairly well. So um, if we don't want to think about this as sort of a deterministic law, but we want to think about it as a statistical law in the sense that we think of the population of cities as random variables. and uh, the collection of cities are just sort of a Monte Carlo process where we draw uh, the populations from some probability distribution. It turns out that there's only one probability distribution that will give Zipf's law. Uh, and that probability distribution is simply that the po uh, probability density that you find a city with population n is inversely proportional to n squared. This is perhaps not that surprising because uh, Zipf's law is basically a statement about the cumulative probability going like 1 over n. So the probability density, of course, should go something like 1 over n squared. OK, so the second law that I want to introduce is something that I will call the inverse rank friendship law. And it just says, um, what is the probability that you know, Alice and Bob are friends, given the geographic separation between Alice and Bob? OK, so uh, imagine that we fix one person. I'm going to call, it, uh, I'm going to call her Alice. What is the probability that she's friends with Bob, given that there are n people between Alice and Bob? There are n people geographically closer to Alice than Bob is. Well, the answer is that the probability is roughly 1 over n. And this was just sort of a fit done um, by using lots of social media data. But um, it turns out that this simple law can actually um, ha explain a lot of consequences about our daily lives. So. Um, for example, in a region with nr people, we would expect that roughly log nr of those people should become our friends in the sense that they would form sort of social media links um, or other types of links. And this simple relationship was exploited by a Nature Communications paper in 2013. And it talked about how like, the phone calls density that you make in a city, um, the contagious disease rates like the spread of uh, sexually transmitted diseases, patenting activity and crime can all be sort of explained by just this very simple consideration. But um, the actual sort of theoretical origin of such a law has not been explored in any detail. Um, this is in contrast to Zipf's law, which has had some sort of theoretical attention. But even then, there's no consensus as to what is the correct sort of derivation of Zipf's law in the sense that what assumptions are actually true about the real world that lead to Zipf's law. OK, so the battle plan for this project is to try to find a, unifying, a single unifying principle that will naturally explain both Zipf's law and the inverse rank friendship law. Um, 
And in addition, to try to make other predictions that we might be able to verify with observations. Um, so if we're able to do this, then this will be very interesting because not only will we provide a derivation of Zipf's law and this inverse rank friendship law, which really uh, neither of them have a solid derivation so far, but we will show that they're actually you know, consequences of one single unifying theory. Okay, so that's what the plan is. Um, let me explain to you now what the unifying principle is that I'm going to use to try to argue that all of these things should be the way they are. Well, first I need to start with some definitions, um, chiefly the power spectrum P of K, which of course you're all familiar with. Um, if you just have the population density as a function of you know, two-dimensional coordinates, um, you know, the population density in New York, whatever, the population density in Louisiana, you can take the Fourier transform, you can square the amplitudes of the Fourier transform, and that gives you, roughly speaking, the power spectrum. You can then define a dimensionless power spectrum, delta squared, which is the power spectrum times k squared, and that gives you, roughly speaking, the amount of variation, the fractional amount of variation um, on a given length square, on a li given length scale. And so delta squared is sort of a way to quantify the variance that you might, it might expect um, on a particular link scale of interest. Second of all, I want to define something very um, arbitrary, but actually quite important. It's uh, x, which is just some monotonically decreasing function of k. So you can think of it as a way to quantify the size of a spatial region. Right? It could be, uh, x could be proportional to 1 over k squared, in which case we would think of this as sort of the area of the region associated with a wavelength of 1 over k. But it doesn't have to be that specific. It can just be any monotonically decreasing function of k. Uh, I won't specify further details of the function. So now I can state the unifying principle, which is that uh, there's sort of random growth on all scales. And what this means more concretely is if you imagine, say, like a collection of farms in the countryside, at every unit of time, you can either add a farm or you can take away a farm. So if you add a farm, then what that means is that the uh, spatial overdensity is going to shift to a slightly larger scale. If you take away a farm, of course, it shifts to a slightly smaller uh, length scale. And so what ends up happening is a random growth or sort of a diffusion equation um, in the continuous time limit. But I emphasize that this is not a diffusion of people in, in two-dimensional space. This is a diffusion of you know, spatial clusters in Fourier space. Now, uh, sort of a trivial solution to the diffusion equation is, of course, delta approaches a constant, which is what we will assume. And you might have been able to guess this just from sort of dimensional analysis, because if we expect uh, delta to be dimensionless, then a sort of natural thing to do is just expect it to be a constant. OK. Um, so if delta is a constant, then delta is pk times k squared. So pk must be 1 over k squared. And this is a prediction that we can then verify or test um, with observations. So here what I've done is just take a Fourier transform of a large map of the United States, the population density map of the United States, and I plotted the power spectrum obtained from doing that. And you can see the predicted curve of k to the minus 2 um, in orange, and the sort of best fit curve that I obtained by doing a best fit um, in blue. And it actually doesn't matter which one is which, because you can see that the two curves are basically right on top of each other. So there's excellent agreement, at this level at least, between theory and observation. So this is the first sort of scaling law that we're able to explain. And this wasn't um, previously explained in the lit literature. I mean, nobody has computed the power spectrum of the population density, as far as I'm aware. So we can go further. Uh, and to do that, we're going to use the press schechter formalism, which traditionally has been used to calculate uh, the dark matter halo function, given the power spectrum of the underlying matter density function of the universe. Right? If you know the power spectrum of the density fluctuations, then you can easily find um, the sort of number function of dark matter halos as a function of mass or as a function of redshift. Here, we're going to think of dark matter halos as cities, right? because sort of conceptually, they're very similar things. Um, we imagine that you know, there's some population density now as a function of position. And once the population density exceeds a certain threshold, then um, that's what we call a city. So in this way, galaxies are sort of analogous to cities uh, in the conventional sense. And we can apply the press schechter formalism to predict the number function now of cities. And when we do that, we recover exactly Zipf's law. 
given the power spectrum that I mentioned. Up to this logarithmic correction factor, but actually in the limit where um, the population of each city is much smaller than the total population of the country, say, then this logarithmic correction factor is not important, and the slope is just minus 2. So I think this is a fairly remarkable result, um, but we can actually go even further and try to derive the inverse rank friendship law. And again, the simple model that we're going to assume is that communities form, I'm just defining the word communities that form, once they exceed a certain threshold, that two people are friends if they're um, elements of the same community. In this case, we can uh, go through the math and we again derive that the average size of a community goes to like log of n, which is sufficient to uh, derive the inverse rank friendship law. So um, now I just want to talk about some sort of future applications we might have. Um, one simple example is the spread of infectious disease. So um, you can think of spreading disease as sort of a phase transition, right? If the average person spreads the disease to more than one person, then it's going to spread like an epidemic, right, until basically everybody's killed. Um, if the average person spreads the disease to much less than one person, then no matter how many people you infect, it's very unlikely that everybody will be killed by the disease, right? So. Uh, the infectiousness defines a phase transition, but the infectiousness is a function of the density, right? So this is empirically true as an undergrad, right? In the dorms, it's very easy to get sick, but uh, in the middle of Siberia, it's very difficult to be infected. So um, there's sort of a phase transition at a certain density threshold, and again, then we can just apply all the tools that we've already been talking about, press excursion, excursion set, whatever, and study a lot of these um, problems from a different perspective and hopefully make new predictions that have not yet been considered. So to conclude, um, this is an example of how thinking about astrophysics has led to some insight about human activity. Um, you can also imagine ways in which thinking about human activity um, influences us about astrophysics. For example, the search for extraterrestrial life. You know, thinking about, you know, for example, industrial pollution may uh, teach us about new ways to search for ETs or something like that. So um, I hope that I've convinced you that this sort of uh, interplay between the two subjects is not crazy, and it's not even a gimmick, but it's really a way to make progress in both fields. Thank you. Right, so it should be n log n, I guess. Yeah, right. it should be n log n. So, so the value of economic activity which connects, which, which scales as a network, and your laws can now give <laughs> concrete numbers to it. So this is, this could, your things could be applicable in many different ways. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I just wanted to make a comment on why Ziff's law appears in so many places. I think a nice way to think about it is if you look at, you know, whether it's people or dark matter halos or whatever, uh, if you have, an, if you look at the number per log interval, right, that can be tilted one way and diverge on the big end, in which case we all live in the biggest city, or it can tilt the other way and diverge on the small end, so we all live alone. Or it can be roughly flat, and mm -hmm. then you have Ziff's law. Right. And so, if you want to avoid horrible divergences, you basically always end up with Ziff's law, or you end up with some other functional form. But if it's a power law, it's always Ziff's law. Mm. Yeah. Just wondering how um, using social media biases the basically friendship. How do you define friendship? Now, I notice you group that into other things like like uh, infectious disease, where you actually have to come into contact. With right. <laughs> Facebook because we have friends who are way, way further away than we would normally have friends. 
Sure. Uh, so actually, I don't know the answer to this question. Um, I, I can't um, speak to exactly how they, um, they, they t I don't know if they've tested this on various different social media networks. Um, all I can tell you that is that if you assume that this is correct, it does explain a lot of things about cities which have nothing to do with uh, the particular social media network site that you're interested in, right? So like the telephone calls, um, it, that's sort of an independent way to test this theory without just trying it on different social networks. So it seems to be a fairly robust result, but uh, unfortunately I can't answer if it's true on different media. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes, all right, great. Uh, so I'm Sarah Wellens, I'm a grad student here at the CFA in Lars's group, and uh, for the past year or so, I've been digging around in the illustrious simulation, looking for this population of galaxies at high redshift, which are very massive and very compact, and trying to figure out how they form. So a little bit of observational background first. Uh, the, these are a bunch of distributions of the typical sizes of galaxies from 3D HST and candles. Uh, each panel here is galaxies in a particular mass bin going up and down and redshift bin going left and right. And they've been further broken down into star-forming galaxies in blue and quiescent galaxies in red. So when we look at, this at these distributions, we can notice a number of interesting things here. One is that at high redshift, there's a big dichotomy between the typical sizes of star-forming and quiescent galaxies, and the t that the typical size of a quiescent galaxy is much smaller at high redshift than its typical size at low redshift. So <clears throat> this population of massive quiescent compact galaxies at high redshift is what I'm interested in. Um, and here are some examples of what these galaxies look like. Uh, these are HST composites from candles. Uh, and you can see from this why sometimes these galaxies are referred to as red nuggets. Um, so <clears throat> we can see observationally that high redshift compact galaxies are predominantly quiescent and that they're much smaller than their local counterparts of, the similar, of similar mass. So these observations have prompted a lot of questions about these galaxies, like how do you even form something that's that dense, 10 to the 11 solar masses and stars within a volume of a, few KPC, a couple kpc, um, where are all the star-forming compact galaxies? Because presumably, compact quiescent galaxies come from compact star-forming galaxies. And what motivates this shift in size toward lower redshift? Uh, I'm primarily going to focus on the first question, which is how do compact galaxies form? But I'll touch on the other ones as well. And of course, I'm approaching this question from the context of illustrious, which most of you have already heard a lot about. But for the sake of our prospective grad students, let me give you a quick rundown. Um, 
So this is a cosmological simulation, a periodic cube, where the side of the cube is 100 megaparsecs. It's initialized in the very early universe and run to the present day, with dark matter and baryons co-evolved throughout the entire volume of the simulation. So this means that it needs not only n-body to handle gravity, but also some treatment of hydrodynamics, which we use the moving, moving mesh code repo for, so that gives us an adaptive resolution so that the densest regions are also the most well-resolved. Um, and also includes physical models for everything that you need to form realistic galaxies, like how gas cools to form stars, how those stars evolve and feed back into their environments through stellar winds and supernovae, and how supermassive black holes accrete and feed back into their environments as well. So this approach has a lot of advantages for the question that I want to ask, which is how do compact elliptical galaxies form? Uh, the fact that the baryons and dark matter are co-evolved throughout the entire volume means that there are tens of thousands of galaxies to choose from. And so even though the population that I am interested in looking at is somewhat rare, just the sheer number of galaxies means that I'm going to get a decent sample of them. And in addition to the volume that provides these statistics, the simulation also has good enough resolution to see galaxies' internal structure, which I'll show you in the next slide. So putting this all together, what this means for me is that populations like compact elliptical galaxies are going to form and evolve in a self-consistent cosmological context. Uh, people have formed compact galaxies in simulations before, but they've mostly been things like um, isolated merger simulations that are somewhat designed to produce these compact galaxies. So I'm taking the opposite approach of just picking them out of that cosmological volume and asking how they got that way and what sets them apart from their non-compact uh, friends. So just to show you what I'm talking about here, I'm going to show you a uh, sample of galaxies that exist in the simulation at Redshift 2, all of which have similar stellar masses, a few times 10 to the 11 solar masses in stars. So these six galaxies over here, are nice extended star forming disks. You can see some spiral features. And in the corner of each panel, I've got the half mass radius of the galaxy, stellar half mass radius. So this is the radius of the sphere that encloses half of the stellar mass. So now, in addition to these nice uh, star forming disks, there are also galaxies like this. These galaxies have the same amount of stellar mass as the galaxies on the left but pack all of that stellar mass into a much smaller volume of space. You can see they all have half mass radii of 2 kpc or below. And these are the galaxies that I'm interested in. These are these compact elliptical galaxies. We can also ask, what might these galaxies look like if we were to, say, observe them with HST? And now on the left, you can see some mock observations of these galaxies, which have been produced using the uh, illustrious mock observation pipeline developed by Paul Torrey and Greg Snyder. Uh, essentially what's been done here is to take the SEDs of the star particles in these galaxies, redshift them to Z, to Z of 2, uh, integrate over some HST band, bin them into pixels, apply the HST PSF, and add in some background noise, and you get some approximation of what we might observe uh, from these galaxies. So now if I bring back the six examples that I showed you at the beginning of real compact elliptical <coughs> galaxies, we can see that at least by eye, these simulated galaxies look like decent analogs to the observed galaxies. And so this gives us some confidence that if we find out how galaxies like this form in the simulation, it might tell us something about how galaxies like this form in the real universe. All right, now what do I mean when I say compact? So here's a scatter plot of mass against radius of all the galaxies with at least 10 to the 10 solar masses in stars at redshift 2. I apply two uh, cuts to this set of galaxies to get my compact uh, population. First of all, I want mass of galaxies, so I make a cut on stellar mass for uh, galaxies with at least 10 to the 11 solar masses in stars. Of course, I also want them to be small, so I make a cut on half mass radius of 2 kpc or below. And then this quadrant of the mass radius diagram is what I'm referring to when I say compact. And when I make the selection, I get 14 massive compact galaxies, and these are the galaxies that I'm going to look at in detail and trace around in the simulation. Now, we can also ask if by making this selection on size, we have also, um, if these galaxies are set apart from the overall population in any other way. So this, again, is, ha is mass radius, and this panel shows you the specific star formation rate. So here's the star formation main sequence. And we can see that most of the compact galaxies have fallen off the star formation main sequence and are quiescent. So by selecting on size, we've also preferentially selected a quiescent population, which again harkens back to the observations. 
So the question that I want to address is, how did these galaxies get into this quadrant of the mass radius diagram? What caused them to be compact? Uh, and I found two mechanisms that in the simulation produce compactness at redshift 2. <laughs> I'm going to show you two examples that demonstrate these two mechanisms, and then I'll return to the overall population. So the first example here is this galaxy shown with a blue line. This is the evolution of a couple of different quantities with redshift. Redshift 2 is over here on the left, so that's where I made my selection. Um, the black line is for comparison. It's the average evolution of all the galaxies which ended up with a similar amount of stellar mass at redshift 2. So th in comparison to that black line, this blue galaxy has been undermassive for most of its lifetime, but catches up very quickly around redshift 2.5, getting almost an order of magnitude of mass between redshifts 3 and 2. Uh, if we look at star formation rate, which is in this panel, we see a big peak in star formation rate at the same time, accompanied by a peak in the accretion rate onto the supermassive black hole. Uh, and this peak in star formation rate didn't just come out of nowhere. It's coincident with the galaxy undergoing a major merger with another galaxy. If we look at the central density, so this is the stellar mass density in the central kiloparsec, we see at the same time that there's a leap in almost two orders of magnitude in central density. So this tells us that not only is there a lot of star formation, but that that star formation is very concentrated in the central kiloparsec of the galaxy. And again, at the same time, when we look at the half mass radius, it falls from about 6 kpc to 2 kpc and gets into my compact regime right under the buzzer before redshift 2. And this is not because the galaxy is physically shrinking, but rather because of the production of a lot of stars at the center it drives down the radius of that sphere that encloses half of the stellar mass. So putting this all together, this tells us a story where for this galaxy, uh, it experienced a major gas-rich merger around redshift 2.5, where tidal torques from the merger drove a lot of gas to the center, and the high gas densities there produced this intense centralized burst of star, formation, of star formation, which produced a compact merger remnant. All right, so this is the first example, a central starburst event. Now, the second example shown in red is very different. Um, recall that the first galaxy was under massive and then caught up very quickly at low redshift. This galaxy, by contrast, has always been over massive and formed essentially all of its stellar mass by redshift 4 with a very high star formation rate at early times and quenching around redshift 4. If we look at the central density, we can see that this galaxy has always been extremely dense. If we look at redshift 6 here, this central density is comparable to the central density of a more massive galaxy at redshift 2. And so because this galaxy has always been very dense, it's always, <laughs> also always been very small. So this galaxy formed with a very small size. And after it formed, was able to maintain that size until I picked it up at redshift 2 because nobody came along and bothered it. Uh, so this tells us quite a different story than the first one. So in this case, this galaxy owes its compactness not to this violent starburst event, but rather simply to the fact that it formed at very high redshift. Uh, it assembled its stellar mass during a period of time when the scale factor was small, everything in the universe was much denser, uh, and so it naturally formed with a smaller size at that early time. And then, because nobody disrupted it after it formed, it maintained that size until I picked it up at redshift 2. So these two mechanisms look very distinct in this kind of evolutionary plot here. In one case, we have this intense uh, starburst event, and in one case, we have this very, very early uh, rapid assembly at early times. These two uh, galaxies also take very distinct tracks across the mass radius diagram in order to reach this compact quadrant here. Uh, here, the, the color of the line indicates the redshift when the galaxy reached that location. So this is the first example that I showed you. You can see this big drop in radius here at late times. And here's the second example, where the galaxy is going essentially horizontally across the mass radius diagram, reaches 10 to the 11 solar masses and stars by redshift 4, and then just hangs out here and waits for everybody else to catch up to it. Um, here, these are the same two panels uh, from the last slide, and now again at redshifts 3, 4, and 5. Now, when I look at all 14 of these galaxies in detail, I see that all of them form in a way that resembles one of these two paths or some combination thereof. Um, while the two mechanisms themselves are quite distinct, an individual galaxy could be more or less affected by either one. But I've color-coded the compact galaxies according to which, which formation mechanism was dominant. 
So the ones that I've colored in red are the early formers. So if we go to Redshift 5, we can see that these are some of the very most massive galaxies that are present in the simulation at that high redshift, and they already have small sizes. The ones that I've colored in blue are the ones that experienced a central starburst. And if we go to Redshift 3, we see that many of them have yet to experience that event that drives them down into the compact regime. So of the 14 galaxies that I looked at in detail, four are compact primarily because they formed very early, and 10 of them undergo this intense central starburst event. All right, so just to sum up, um, I've searched around in Illustrious for this compact elliptical population and found a population that resembles or is analogous to the observed population of compact galaxies, traced them back to higher redshift, uh, and found that they are all compact either because they formed very early or experienced a central starburst event or some combination thereof. <coughs> Thanks. As a matter of fact, you are absolutely correct. When we look at what? Isn't that a isn't that a smaller? Isn't that less massive? Okay. Yeah. Right, so um, this is exactly what you're talking about. Uh, these two panels show age gradients um, of, of the stars in these galaxies. So this is a, a age as stellar age as a function of radius with the age of the core taken out. And so um, in the case of the early forming guys, the core is the oldest part, and there's some residual star formation on the outside. <laughs> And in the starburst case, the core is the newest part, and the outside is the remnants of the merger progenitors. So in this case, it goes red to blue, and in this case, it goes blue to red. Um, and so I'm not sure how observable that is, but it is something that we see to distinguish between them in the simulation. Um, Well, yeah, I don't know what super compact means, but there are some where both occur. So there's one, for example, which forms early and then also has another starburst event, um, which drives down its size even further. Um, but it's not, it's not obviously more compact than the other ones. It's a similar kind of size. Yes. <laughs> All right, no, this is going to be a hard question. Okay. Just referring back to when you had your lots of the stellar mass, you said what at half of the radius or whatever was, that's what most of the stellar mass was. By stellar mass, are you excluding like gas, dust, and dark matter? Exactly. So it only includes the stars. Yeah. Okay. So only the luminous. Okay. Yeah. So I was just wondering, is there like a relevance if you would include that? Is there like any sort of, I don't know if you If you include the, the other baryons, you mean? Yeah, yeah basically. Yeah. Um, keep those on. Oh, well, yeah, of course, yes. Uh, so I would say it depends on what time you're asking the question. So, so by the time that they're quiescent, they have mostly don't have a lot of dense gas left, and so the, dense, the gas isn't going to matter very much. Um, and at earlier times when they're gas-rich, often the gas distribution kind of traces the stellar distribution, or the other way around, really. Um, so it probably wouldn't make a huge difference. Yeah. But if we come to Harvard, then we <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, here's the, uh, the metaphor here, the invisible man. I'll be talking about magnetism in the solar corona, the outer atmosphere of the sun, and in particular, a, a particular kind of structure called a coronal cavity, a void, a seamless, empty region, hence the analogy to the invisible man. I, I've added a subheader uh, here of lagomorphs, lollipops, and liftoff, because those are going to be your take-home take points. Um, so let me proceed. Do I have a pointer here? So first, let me define what I mean by prominences and cavities. So the solar cone is very hot. It's a million degrees. And so this is surprising because the surface of the sun is only about 55,000 or so degrees Kelvin. So it jumps up to these extreme temperatures. It's also very sparse. There's not a lot of mass there. Prominences and the cavities that surround them are relatively cool. So the prominences themselves are about 10,000 degrees and dense. They're about 100 times denser than the surrounding uh, corona. Plasma that's suspended in the coronal atmosphere. And we know that the force that suspends them there and that keeps them is the magnetic field. Um, the prominence, it's seen here in H alpha. When it's on the disk, we call it a filament. And at the limb, we call it a prominence. And when we see the region above it, and this is like a chronograph observation, so this is what you would see if you were looking at a, 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 an eclipse in white light you see this dark void that goes up and around the prominence, and that is the cavity. Now, these cavities are stable structures. We see the structure like this for days and days, even weeks. We can see it rotate around and come back on the other side of the sun. The sun rotates 27 days. But they are actually quite dynamic when you look at it. These are movies. This one is kind of hard to tell it's a movie. This is a prominence zoomed in on, and you can see that there's constant flows all the time. This is a cavity with a prominence in the middle. And it's showing you flows not just in the prominence material, but also in the coronal material, the hot material that's surrounding it. So these things are very dynamic. But as I said, they can stay put for days and days and days until they don't. And here we'll see a cavity which had been sitting there for a long time. And it's slowly, over the course of hours, erupting outwards. And these are so-called coronal mass ejections which are the source of space weather, and which I'll talk a little bit more about in my colloquium today. So the question of what is driving eruptions like this and what is creating the structures we see leads us back to the magnetic fields. How do we measure the magnetic fields? We can take observations now in the corona of linear polarization, which is a diagnostic sensitive to the direction of the magnetic field. And the first thing we notice, what I'm showing here is a sequence of cavities so you're looking at, this is the edge of the sun. It's like a quadrant. And here is a cavity that's above it. And each of these dark regions is a region of low plasma. And it's observed in extreme ultraviolet. If I look at now the linear polarization measurement, I get these very curious structures that, at least to me, look like rabbit heads. So we called them rabbit heads and things like that. And then we got pushed back because it didn't sound scientific. So we translated to Greek, and it's now lagomorph. <laughs> And that seems to be better accepted. <laughs> so the lagomorphs show up essentially every time we get a cavity like this. Well, we think we understand exactly why. Because when you take a magnetic flux rope, so this is a distribution of magnetic field where magnetic fields wind around a central axis. And you synthesize, you forward model what you would expect to see in linear polarization, you get exactly this structure. And I'll talk a little bit more in my talk this afternoon about why. But it's a clear evidence that such, such a magnetic structure exists. Well, this is really interesting, because the magnetic flux rope represents a state uh, where magnetic energy is stored and can be released in the process of a coronal mag mass ejection. And a magnetic flux rope can explain all sorts of structures. These are the lollipops that we see in the cavity. This is a cavity. And inside, you have that prominence, and you have this dark region above it. Here's the prominence, and there's the cavity above it. This is three different wavelengths of light. And depending on where you look at it, you get something with a central void. This particular structure was made the news because um, I don't know if you can see it from here, but it's a very dark, focused orb. And underneath it has a very, very narrow prominence going down to the sun. And so people thought it looked like a UFO that was refueling at the sun and it had a fueling line. Um, but we can explain it without having to resort to extraterrestrials. Um, magnetic flux rope models. This is a nice simulation 
which has uh, thermodynamics taken into account. And so the color is showing you the temperature. And inside a magnetic flux rope, you can see these hot central cores. And they're suspended above where you would expect the mass to collect in the prominence. So the interpretation is that there's a, a thermodynamic or a topological interface associated with the nested toroidal surfaces, the field lines. Think of a slinky, but nested slinkies. And each one may have slightly different thermal properties. And finally, the liftoff, the CMEs. Well, as I said, these are stable structures, but they um, have clues. So for example, when we look at the shape of a cavity, I had an undergraduate working with me a couple summers ago, and he looked at about 100 cavities, and he found a clear uh, trend that if you have a cavity that's uh, sort of short and squat, it doesn't tend to erupt. If you have one which has a clear circular cross-section or elliptical cross-section, it may erupt. But when you have one that has a teardrop shape, it will erupt. And um, these are the percentages he found. And I, it's gotten to the point that if I see a teardrop-shaped cavity, I will, in fact, predict that it's going to erupt within about 24 or 48 hours. It's a good predictor. So why is that? Well, again, going back to the magnetic flux rope, we can come up with some reasons. Because models of magnetic flux ropes, what happens is you have uh, magnetic fields that are winding around an axis. And it can ha it's a stable equilibrium. It's bound to force balance. But eventually, as things change at the boundary below it, um, you add twist to the structure, and at some point, it starts to rise just ever so slowly. And when it does, it sets up a process where it forms current sheets underneath it. And the narrowing of the current sheet underneath this flux rope is what's giving you that teardrop shape. And it's sort of like lighting a fuse on the system, because once that happens, it slowly rises more, and so on, and so on. And eventually, it reaches a point where it simply can't find an equilibrium, and it erupts. Um, and this has been demonstrated with models of flux ropes um, by these authors and by authors in the audience. Uh, and uh, it's, it's sort of the interpretation is that topological changes are leading to some sort of ideal instability. So that's, that's it. Those are my three points. And uh, what I hope the take-home message is that these observations that you get in the corona give you clues to the magnetism, even when sometimes there appears to be nothing there. Thank you. Actually, um, no, but that brings up a really interesting question because reconnection plays a major role. What I mean by ideal instabilities is, in fact, uh, an instability that happens that doesn't require reconnection. So magnetic fields um, operate if they're in, uh, we often treat them in a region where it's ideal magnetohydrodynamics. Um, and, but that can be broken. Magnetic field lines can snap or break, and that's a reconnection. And that process is what's going into the, the building up and the rising of the flux rope. It's breaking down at the bottom. It's slowly rising. The ideal instability is it's basically uh, it's a, a mode of the kink instability. So you can have too much twist, and a, a structure will writhe. If you twist up a phone cord, it'll do that. The m equals 0 mode of the kink instability is called the torus instability. And it's, it's, a, it's when you have a, a balance between the hoop force pushing the thing out and some sort of constraining force stopping it broken when it reaches a certain height relative to the drop of the surrounding fields. In the linear polarization, have you seen signatures of any of those three? Reconnection or the, the instability? So we're just starting to see the linear polarization observations are in a, it's a sort of a prototype low resolution uh, instrument. And I have seen a few cases where that lagomorph um, gets high enough up that you can see a, sort of a gap underneath it. Uh, in its, its head, so to speak. And I believe that's just an indication of an X-type topology where you would have the reconnections occurring and you'd be re rising to the point of the instability. Yeah. Absolutely. There are two problems, as there tends to be. First of all, we're looking from the Earth. And these cavities are at the limb of the sun. By, by, that's where we can see them. So the cavities that erupt are pointing exactly the wrong direction for the Earth. But if we had a spacecraft that was at the, Earth's, uh, uh, the, 
the L5 point in the Earth's orbit. So it was about 60 degrees and it was pointing, you would be seeing the cavities then that are pointing towards the Earth and then it could be exactly a predictor of it. The other thing to bear in mind though is that these cavities are very high latitude. That's why we have such a clear view of them. Um, so they also may not reach the Earth down in the ecliptic and they tend to be sort of slower eruptions. They're larger scale phenomena. Um, what's interesting is that there's a self-similarity of scale of these large scale phenomena that you see in the cavities and the strong active regions, which are the ones that really cause the bad space weather. And Antonia Savcheva here has worked on uh, the same kind of modeling, but in the active region and gets a similar teardrop shape for them. You wouldn't observe them as cavity, but it may be exactly the same process. again, everybody. So um, here I will just switch to 15 orders of magnitude higher magnetic field that you have just heard, so which means that we will not have so nice details that you heard about, but still we can do a lot of physics of it and we can study many, many physical effects that happen in material when you embed it in this strong magnetic field. Unfortunately, not with such great details, but with enough detail to get some conclusions. So. Neutrons, I will speak about pulsars. Pulsars are neutron stars, which are, which means something of the mass of the sun, just such, has compact, has a 10 kilometers radius, so they are very compact, their crust has more or less nuclear densities, and their magnetic field are of the order of 10 to the 15, till 10 to, 10 to the 12, till 10 to the 15 Gauss, which are the magnetars. So we know, uh, sorry, we know many neutron stars that we, uh, for which we can study their emissions, period distribution, and everything. This plot somehow summarizes most of the neutron stars we know, which are more than 2,000 sources. This is the spin period, so the period in which, with which they rotate, and this is the first derivative of the period, so how they slow down. Different colors are different classes of neutron stars. So you can have radio pulsars, which are these black dots, which are more or less 2,000 sources, magnetars, very strong magnetic field neutron star with strong field decay, we have X-ray beam isolated neutron stars, stuff which are, the colored ones are mainly emitting in the X-ray band. So they are observed with Chandra XMM and X-ray satellites. And those are instead more uh, emitting in the radio. They are discovered usually in the radio band. Now, one thing I want to focus in this talk, it's a work that we have recently done, so last year with some postdoc of mine and a colleague. So what we wanted to explain is why isolated pulsar have a limiting spin period. So why you see only isolated pulsar, just nothing which is slower than 12 seconds. So this seems something, I mean, uh, that people usually give for granted. The usual explanation is magnetic field decay, but this is, has not been deepened uh, more than that since last year that we started to study this. Now, this is just how we estimate the magnetic field of those objects. So if you have a rotating body, you have rotational energy, a dipole, magnetic dipole, so you have the Larmor formula gives you with the, 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 the power, the, let's say the magnetic power. So somehow you can from here, if you think that those are the two energies that balances, you can estimate the magnetic field, a very rough estimate, which is from your spin period and the first derivative that you measure from observations. Now, so what's the problem we want to tackle? So why we don't see slow isolated pulsar, nor in the X-ray, nor in the radio? Now, from the radio point of view, there is an observational bias. There are several observational biases. First, it's on how these are observed, because you need some, some high period filters are called. So in many surveys, there are some filters that's in the observation that do not allow you to observe radio pulsars lower than, let's say, 10 seconds or so. Other uh, uh, biases are instead physical. So the radio luminosity of those objects is highly dependent on their spin period. So the lower the period, the lower the luminosity, which means the lower the probability of detecting them. However, in the X-ray range, we don't have any bias. So X-ray pulsars have a 12-second limit is intrinsic because there is no limit in the 
X-ray observation, so no bias observationally, no bias physically. So in principle, if there are X-ray pulsars lower than 12 seconds, we should have seen it so far. Actually, pulsars in X-ray binaries are continuously observed to have periods lower than that in the X-ray band, while isolated ones do not. So as I said, this was thought for many years to be due to magnetic field decay, but nobody really could, um, but that tells you that, sorry, that tells you somehow those are some lines of magnetic field decay, how the decay of the magnetic field just uh, goes in the PP dot diagram, which is the same diagram as before, different classes of pulsars. So you see when you are one kilo year, more or less, a strong magnetic field you start with, then you start decaying, and at certain point you have a limiting period, which depends on which field you start with and the age of the source. Now, but whether this limiting period is here or here, that depends on the field distribution you have at the beginning and of the source. But how can we then model it? So which is driving it? So what is driving the field decay giving you 10 second limit or 30 second <coughs> limit? So in order to do that, so we have uh, built a magnetic field decay mo model, which it's uh, pretty complicated, so you have to solve several differential equation of state. You have to in, in, insert some microphysics in it, neutrino emissivity that you have in your crust, which are nuclear densities embedded with strong magnetic field, which, is our some, which means something that you cannot really test on Earth. So th there are several, several, um, several let's say, microphysics that we have to put in here. So we did all this. And this is more or less the field decays in luminosity that you expect for what happened to the luminosity of the source. This is thermal luminosity that you measure in the X-ray band from the X-ray spectrum. This is the age of the object, several objects. And you see that depending on the field they have and the age they have, they are expected to have the luminosity they have. So somehow everything uh, works. But what we want our question was, which is the parameter which is driving the 12 second rather than the 30 seconds? So in order to do that, we did several simulations. So we changed the parameters in our code. So this is, again, in all cases, in these two cases, age, again, thermal luminosity. This is magnetic field decay. And here it's changing, for instance, the field configuration. So field only in the crust, field only in the core, field in the crust and in the core, different, different um, intensity. And you see how it decays, how it, it goes in age, and how it goes in the PP dot diagram. And you see you have different curves that depends on the, on the configuration. You also have different curves. This is, again, magnetic field, luminosity, and this is the PP dot diagram, different curves depending on the mass you assume for the source at the beginning, depending also on the impurity, which means, what is the impurity? I will go a bit more in detail just in a second. The impurity, it's a parameter that you use in the crust. So how different is your crust from a pure lattice? This is more or less what it is. Then I will speak just a second more. So what we found with all these simulations, which are months and months of runs, what we found is that the main parameter which is driving the, the how you decay in here in the PP dot, which means your limiting period, it's indeed this impurity. So it's the things that it's affecting more the decay of the, of the spin periods in the population. This is again the PP dot diagram, several curves with different impurity. Those are with very low impurity, this is with very high. So the higher the impurity in your inner crust, the, e the easier it is to bend this decay curve and the easier it is to predict that you have, do not have any X-ray pulsar, which is slower than 12 seconds. So why this is important? This is important because a strong impurity, so, sorry, since many years, uh, nuclear physicists have predicted that if you have a strong magnetic field and a nuclear density, a density which is higher, 10 to the 13 grams per centimeter minus cube, this is something that no way you can create on Earth. So the only places where you can actually test this are neutron stars and magnetars because you need high magnetic field. So they had predicted that nuclear do not have a, a crystal um, lattice configuration, but they shape has what they are called the pasta shape, which is something like this in, in loops, in bowls, so it's not a pure crystal, but it's a pasta. And this is somehow what this impurity is it's telling you. So how, much clo how closer you are to the pasta rather to a pure lattice where you would have impurity equal to zero. So what actually we found is that indeed, and this is very well suited for a lunch talk, is that <laughs> indeed 
um, for the first time, first for the first time after several, after a decade of studies and of grant, writing proposals saying that with magnetars and pulsar we can constrain the physics in high magnetic field, but nobody of us ever actually believed that you can really do physics with astrophysics. And actually, this is the first example, I mean, at least in, in my, my career, the first example where we actually did physics. So we had the first evidence that the pasta phase do exist in, in dense matter and in strong magnetic field, which cannot be tested on Earth uh, anyway. And this is actually, in this example, it's on a non-finding. So it's on an upper limit, which is the 12 second, which is also, I think, very interesting in general, the fact that we can get uh, in nature physics with an upper limit. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is it about the neutron star that determines the level of impurity, how much pasta there is? Well, so the point is that the level of impurity we don't really know because what we are modeling, I mean, in our models, there are, there are no detailed simulations of the exact, so what we have, it's a measure of the conductivity in the inner crust. So the more, the more, let's say, the more fast the electron moves, the more you decay the field, so the more you bend in your PP dot diagram. And this is, uh, to have this electron decaying the field very fastly, you need this not to be a pure lattice, otherwise it would go very, very low. So this is somehow what we call impurity, which is a single parameter in the model, which just tells you how different from a lattice you are. Now, how much different this is a whole other question that needs further simulations and, and from nuclear physics point of view rather than astrophysics. That's that it. would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, it would. But it's not my job. <laughs> yes. Okay, so thank you. Thank you.